Welcome to this webinar on reactivity. What we are going to aim to do today is to look at what reactivity is and how we can help our dogs overcome it using techniques like zoopharmacognosy and Tellington T-Touch. But the first thing we're going to do is look at the definition of two words which are important in this context. The first one is aggression. What is it? These are the dictionary and definitions of what aggression is. The first one is that aggression is a forceful action or procedure such as an unprovoked attack, especially when it is intended to dominate or master some other creature. The second one is when attacks are made or encroachments are made on the territory, for example, of another country or another person. So that kind of act would be um, an act of aggression and could lead to a war. Aggression is also defined as feelings of anger or antipathy, which result in hostile or violent behavior with a readiness to attack or to confront the other individual. And the fourth um, definition of aggression is that it is an action of attacking without provocation. So with no provocation, one person or one animal will attack another. In psychology, the term aggression refers to a whole range of behaviors that can result in physical and psychological harm to the person or animal itself, to others, or to objects in the environment. So this type of behavior centers mainly on harming another person or another animal, either physically or mentally. Now let's look at reactivity. What's that? The definition of reactivity is that it is a state of being reactive. And reactive is responding to an action or a stimulus outside. So if something happens, it can be good or bad, and an individual responds to it, then that is a reaction to that stimulus. <clears throat> it can also, in terms of um, be a return to one condition after being in another state, for example, return to a um, state of depression after a state of excitement, which is one of the things which, for example, people with bipolar disorder would suffer from. So let's compare these two. The truth is that there are very few inherently aggressive dogs. And what most, we can mostly say that we can actually make a dog aggressive by our behavior, by the way we treat it, or by the training methods that we use. But generally speaking, what most people refer to as aggression is actually reactivity. They will say, oh, that dog's aggressive because he reacted to their little dog as they were passing by. But in fact, he was only reacting to the other dog, maybe not in the best possible way, but he wasn't actually necessarily being aggressive. So, what are the sources of reactivity and how can it be manifest? Generally speaking, reactivity comes from anxiety and anxiety comes from a feeling of being uncertain about something. So if an animal is not quite sure of what is happening to it or what the position is in the situation that it's in at that moment, then that leads to uncertainty and, and that leads to anxiety and from that anxiety, there can be a reactive behavior. Often, reactivity is an information-seeking strategy. For example, I have a little rescue um, miniature pincher. Well, I have two, actually, mother and daughter. And the younger one, the daughter, when she's not quite sure about something, she stands still, points her head towards it, and then rushes towards it. She stops before she gets there. But basically what she's trying to do is to see what level of threat does this thing pose to her. And sometimes, well, it has, nothing has ever happened to her, but she has on a couple of occasions rushed up to a wild boar. Fortunately, the wild boar didn't pay any attention to her since she's so small. So reactivity then can be an information seeking strategy for the dog to suss out what's going on. And then in those circumstances, a reactive dog may rush towards something or someone that he or she is uncertain about. 
and they may bark or they may lunge or growl or make a big display of one form or another. But what we see as reactive behavior um, and many people perceive reaction behavior, reactive behavior as an aggression, but the reactive dog is actually not rushing in to do any damage. Um, and what we see as a problem, in this case that the dog is reacting to certain situations, well, the dog may not actually be a problem at all. Because what the dog is trying to do is, as I said, to assess the threat level of a given situation. And his assessment strategy is intensified because he's panicking as the adrenaline flows through, through his body. And when the adrenal, adrenaline levels reach a certain height, then he may go in, out of thinking mode and into reactive mode, which is what generally happens. So um, also people sometimes perceive reactive behavior as dominant behavior because they think that a dog that flies at a trigger is a dog that wants to take charge of the situation. And this is generally speaking, absolutely untrue. Generally speaking, reactive dogs are anxious and their response is intense because they're afraid and they're overwhelmed by the situation that they find themselves in. Now, as I just said, we may think that certain behaviors are a problem and they may in fact be a problem to us. For example, if a dog is lunging at people or barking too much or whatever. But in fact, for the dog, that behavior probably doesn't constitute a problem at all. In fact, it may have actually served that dog very well because in, by reacting in certain ways, he may have been able to help keep himself safe, may have been able to deal with stress, control certain aspects of his life, obtain food, keep any potential threats at bay, and so on. For example, dogs that guard the perimeter, basically what they're saying is, this is my patch and I don't want anyone coming into it. Um, in shelters, you may find that dogs react over food um, and also over their space because they don't have so much space and they may um, find that by being reactive towards food, they get what they want or what they need. So in many cases, reactive behavior has benefits for the animal in question. Now, if we have a reactive animal and we don't do anything about the behavior which we regard as a problem or which society regards as a problem, then that reactivity may actually escalate into a more aggressive form of, of um, behavior. And, or if it's, left untreated or if it's treated inappropriately with physical punishment, for example. And because as we've said, um, most aggression and reactivity obviously is anxiety related, then reactivity and anxiety related aggression are simply different levels of response to a, to a stressful situation. It's like going up a step, Your, the dog is calm, then it becomes reactive, it's on step one, and then it goes on to anxiety-related aggression, which is up further up the stair. So um, anxiety-related aggression will occur when the dog is put into a situation that pushes him beyond what he can manage with a measured response. So basically, the animal is overwhelmed. And in these cases, the dog's anxiety level takes him to the next level of response, which is to do something um, more assertive. The, these um, quotes are taken from Leslie McDevitt, who has some very interesting things to say in her book. So now that we've had a look at what aggression and reactivity actually are, what can we do to help an animal that is suffering from this? If anxiety is mostly due to, if reactivity is mostly due to anxiety, and anxiety occurs when the animal feels unable to cope with a certain situation, then we need to help that dog feel safe and secure. And to do that, we need to help build the animal's self-confidence. And we also need to understand what it is that's triggering the reactivity in the first place. How do we do that? Well, the basis of all our therapies is observation. And our aim here is to be the best doggy detective in this case that we can be. It can be doggy detective or cat detective or horse detective or whatever animal we happen to be working with. So we want to find out what are the things that make this animal feel insecure, afraid, or threatened. 
And to find this out, we must observe how the animal reacts when faced with different situations. So what are some possible triggers that may um, set off reactive behaviors? Coming into contact with new people, people coming into the animal's home space, strange dogs coming into the animal's home space, or another animal, a cat, for example, coming into his home space. Meeting strange dogs when out walking, or perhaps not all strange dogs, but only particular kinds of dogs or particular sizes of dogs. It could also be specific noises. We are all very familiar with the problem of fireworks, um, also with um, gunshot. It can also be the noise that pneumatic brakes make uh, on um, when you have big lorries and trucks passing by. Uh, it can also be children. Children may be a trigger because children, as we know, move very fast. So that's kind of like um, prey behavior. And they also tend to speak in loud voices, high-pitched voices, and they tend to gesticulate a lot, moving their hands around. And I had a real exam life example of that. My bearded collie, Sasha, is not particularly um, bothered about people. He keeps his distance from them. He's not... He won't go up to them or look for um, attention from strangers. But one day we were walking and some teenage girls were coming in the opposite direction. And because he's such a handsome boy, then he, they were attracted to him and came running along the street shouting, oh, look, oh, look, what a beautiful dog. Oh, I want to talk to him. And flailing their arms around in the air. So of course, what did he do? He gave them a wide berth, went round them and didn't want to know. And then they were very disappointed. So I had to explain to them, well, look, he didn't come near you because first of all, he doesn't know you. Second of all, you came rushing up to him, which is not a very polite thing to do in dog terms. Thirdly, you were screaming your heads off, which is aggressive behavior as far as he's concerned. And you were flailing your arms around, and arms for dogs can be quite um, unacceptable things. So we have to think of simple things like that, which we may not always think about. Another thing which may be a trigger is if a dog sees people um, who walk differently. For example, someone who has a disability, somebody who is limping, somebody who is using a walking frame, an elderly person, but also um, some people, for example, people with Down syndrome, sometimes walk in a very peculiar way, which animals may find off-putting. And the last thing that I've put here, and although I put it in the last place, this does not mean to say that it's the least important, far from it. We have to find out, is the animal suffering any pain or injury? And his reaction may be a way of trying to protect himself from other people or dogs, keeping them away so that they don't touch him in that place which is painful. And in this regard, I always remember um, a story, I was reading a book about a family in South Africa who had a big farm and they adopted a herd of ele elephants which were going to be put down from another national park. I think it was in Zimbabwe, but I'm not quite sure. The elephants were shipped to this family's farm and they were very well behaved and fine animals. And in fact, one young male was born on the farm and he was very used to people and very gentle. And then suddenly his behavior changed and um, he began to not want people to come close to him and he began to have charging behavior and so on. So since these people had set up a tourist um, initiative on their farm, they decided that this was not acceptable and so they had the elephant put down. And it wasn't until afterwards that they discovered that the reason for this change in his behavior was that he had a toothache. Now, if they had thought about something like that beforehand and had put an anesthetic dart, they would have been able to deal with it. But there it was, a young animal in his prime, healthy in every way, except he had a toothache, and for that he died. So we can often overlook simple things 
which may be causing an animal to react um, in, a, in an unacceptable way. And then the other thing we've got to think about is, are we contributing to these behaviours? We tend to think, in the best, with the best will in the world, that all the blame lies with the dog, and we are doing our best to resolve the situation. And usually we are doing our best, but often we, the owners or handlers, without knowing it, are either contributing to provoke or foster or exacerbate the, the behavior by our own actions. And these may be, for example, as we mentioned before, our tone of voice. Our tone of voice may be completely unacceptable to that animal and may even be frightening. Our movements, are they too brusque? And we are frightening the animal away. When we are out and we see something which um, we consider to be a possible threat, are we tensing the lead? Because we often do this long before the animal has actually seen the threat. So our actions in this case are part of the problem. And recently, Dr. Ian Dunbar actually posted a thing, an article um, about um, precisely this. He said, people come and say to me, um, oh, the dog pulls on the lead when he sees something and he does this and he does that. And he said, but then the dog tells me exactly the same story. This person tenses my lead when we see something new. And so in fact, the person is contributing to this behavior without knowing it or without realizing it. Now, this is understandable. When a person has a reactive dog and the person is afraid of what the consequences might be if something were to happen. Um, so it is understandable, but it's not helpful. So this is why we've got to try and do something about it. So a helpful tool when we are observing is the Tule Drugas chart of calming signals. Because if we study those and look at our own animals or other animals that we're working with, for the messages to see what the animal is trying to communicate to us through its body language. The other thing we want to look at is what is the degree of stress, fear or anxiety which is induced by each circumstance? Is it mild or is it strong? Now, for example, in, it may be one trigger has a mild reactive response, whereas another trigger may have a very strong reactive response. So um, in general, the reaction is the dog's coping strategy. It's how the dog feels that it can deal with that situation. The next thing we want to find out is, is the reaction worse when the dog is on the lead? Now, this is generally true, because once we've put a lead on a dog, we have taken away all that animal's options. The animal is, to all intents and purposes, a prisoner. He cannot escape. So, generally speaking, when an animal feels um, caught, then its reactions are most likely to be stronger. And then third, the last thing we want to look at is, when did this behavior actually first manifest? Is it something that happened? And if we can think of, think back to when it first happened and can we remember what was going on at that time? Now, what not to do when we have a reaction? We don't want to punish the dog because that is totally counterproductive. We don't want to shout at the dog because we're probably only going to raise its, its anxiety level even further. And we are not going to use aversive training techniques, which are totally counterproductive, although they may in fact cover up the problem by mm, the dog will learn that it's worse um, if it reacts and therefore it will do what is being asked of it, but we're not actually getting to the root of the problem. And the other thing that we're not going to do is keep on doing the same old thing. If we want something to change, we have to change something first. And if we change something, then that can change the whole dynamic of the situation. So how can we help? If we look at it now from the zoopharmacognosy perspective, um, in we've seen that fear, stress, anxiety, and lack of confidence, or any combination of these, may lie at the heart of reactive behaviors. So one substance that may address many aspects of these issues is spirulina, because spirulina, as we know from our courses, contains so many minerals which animals may be lacking, and this lack may be contributing to these behaviors. 
The other major thing that spirulina contains is the vitamin B complex. And as we know, vitamin B complex is fundamental for the health of the nervous system. So a strong nervous system is important when animals are suffering from anxiety. So taking a look briefly at some oils for anxiety, in our other webinar, we went into anxiety in great depth. So we're not going to do that here. I'm just going to go briefly over the oils. We've got bergamot, which has a um, hormonal component, particularly for males. Copaiba, frankincense, which we know is the major oil for fear. Geranium, particularly for females, when reactive behavior has particularly a hormonal uh, component, then geranium oil may be one that the animal would choose. German chamomile, um, because German chamomile reacts in the body in such a way that it helps to bring down um, or stop the elevation of cortisol levels. So that's important. Hemp is of course another very calming oil and hops also. Sometimes you may find that animals will select more than one of these at the same time. If the problem is one of fear of people, and particularly fear of men, which is a very common problem, then linden blossom is an oil which many of these animals would um, choose. Marjoram also has a hormonal component and um, I think I said in some of my courses, told the, the anecdote, how in the Middle Ages, marjoram was burned in monasteries in order to control the hormonal levels in these communities. Neroli is also a very calming oil and for anxiety and particularly separation anxiety, which may also cause reactive behaviors. Orange, we know that all the... Um, Citrus oils, of which orange is obviously one, um, are very good at enhancing the feeling of well-being. So if an animal feels better, it's less likely to react. Roman chamomile, we know, again, is a very calming oil. St. John's wort. St. John's wort is a major macerated oil, which many animals will choose to take when they are suffering from anxiety and that anxiety may be giving rise to reactivity. So St. John's wort is a really important thing to have on hand. Spikenard is another very calming, nurturing oil. Valerian, we all know, is very calming. And another important point about valerian is that because it is derived from the root of the plant, then um, it's also grounding. And generally speaking, reactive animals are lacking in grounding they're way off somewhere else during their reactions. So we want to bring them back down to earth and grind them. Vetiver is another one which um, is very useful for calming animals. Mm -hmm. And apart from these major primary oils, we've also got supporting oils and oils for releasing emotion. <clears throat> so for support, we've got calendula, we've got barley grass, which as we know is very similar, has very similar properties to spirulina. It will, dogs tend to choose spirulina more than barley grass. Barley grass, horses, for example, would choose barley grass probably more often. Coconut oil, lavender, rice bran, and tobacco oil. Now, tobacco oil is important because when um, an animal is reactive, it's actually not thinking. So um, tobacco has an impact on the cognitive function and therefore could be a very important ally when we are trying to deal with reactivity and get the animal back into thinking mode. Then for emotional release, and often reactive behaviors may be due to something that the animal is holding on to, we've got angelica root, which again, because it's a root, is grounding. We have yarrow, which releases another big releasing oil, and rose. So rose may be in the form of essential oil or floral water. We often find that older animals, young animals, or animals who are sickly and therefore more delicate may choose the floral water in preference to the essential oil. And then just to briefly, for specific uses, fear, we've got frankincense. 
Fear of loud or sudden noises, we've got frankincense for the fear and sandalwood for the noise component. <clears throat> fear of people, especially men lived in blossom. Animals who are reactive are often reactive because in the past they've had negative experiences or they have suffered pain. And when they find themselves in certain situations, it may remind them of previous situations and therefore they are anticipating that they're going to feel pain or have a negative experience again. And in this case, violet is a go-to oil. Also, fear of change or inability to deal with change, violet leaf. And that is a major thing. A lot of animals find it difficult to deal with change. And in the world that we live in, we tend to think that our animals will like to come with us everywhere. Now, this may not always be the case. In the past, all of my dogs, for example, just loved to come, didn't matter where it was. But at the moment, I have a dog who is not happy to go everywhere. So I've learned that it's better not to force them into those situations. But violet leaf is um, a useful oil for, those, for that. Lack of confidence is another component of reactivity, as we've said, and ylang ylang is um, a, an important oil for that. Then the, we mentioned the point about pain, that reactive responses may occur because an animal feels pain or has a wound that which we haven't noticed or has aches in the joints. Now, this may very well be the case with senior animals um, and even some animals who have displaced, hip displacement and things like that. So by offering oils which are often selected by animals with pain, we may discover an unsuspected underlying cause. Um, of the animal's reactivity. And some of the oils that we might offer would be yarrow, birch, um, peppermint, German chamomile, and wintergreen. Dogs will tend to choose birch over wintergreen, but some dogs do actually choose wintergreen as well. Um, now, heredity. What if we cannot identify any specific cause of the animal's reactive responses? What if the animal was simply born that way? We know that if a mother experiences trauma during pregnancy, the offspring may be affected. Some fetuses are able to manage that situation and when they're born, after they're born, they show no visible signs of trauma. Um, and that's fine, that's great. But other fetuses may not be able to deal with it so well or perhaps the degree of trauma was so great that it was just not possible to deal with it. And so when they're born, they are carrying that load of trauma which they have inherited from their mother. And now we know that actually it goes even much deeper than just the mother. Research done at the University of Edinburgh um, shows that trauma suffered even several generations back may impact a newly born um, puppy, dog, person, horse, whatever. And in fact, the most recent information that I have seen is that they have been able to ascertain that the trauma may be passed down even over 14 generations. And they were working with mice, so of course the reproductive um, cycle is quick, so they were able to do that if they were working with horses or something, it may not be, um, possible. that might not be a possibility, but with mice they could do it. So this is a uh, very important thing to bear in mind, that animals may actually come into the world with a charge of trauma that they have inherited, either from the mother or previous generations. So um, from our zoopharmacognosy, we know that after the birth, it's always a good idea to offer both the mother and the babies, some oils for trauma and emotional release. Giving birth is a traumatic experience and being born can also be a traumatic experience. So we might offer Rose Otto, Rose Absolute, Angelica, or Yarrow también also. So even if the animal was born some time ago, it's still important to offer these oils because the animal may have been carrying these traumas since birth with a negative impact on behavior. So whenever you're going to deal with an animal, um, whether it's your own or someone else's, it's always a good idea 
to offer these release oils because even if the major emotional traumas have been released, day-to-day -day living also brings us traumas and upsets. And so generally speaking, I tend to offer oil or, yes, oil, um, the rose oil generally um, at the start of a zoopharmacognosy session because you never know what the animal may be needing to release. Now, another therapy which some people may be interested in having a look at is homeopathy. And if you have a holistic vet who offers homeopathy, then a very good option is to ask the vet to identify the dog's constitutional remedy. Because the constitutional remedy takes into account the full spectrum of the living being, health, <clears throat> behavior, personality. And if the vet can identify what the constitutional remedy is, then it can enormously help to re-establish balance on every level, physical, mental, and emotional. Um, for example, a dog that has an overwhelming need for structure and finds it difficult to deal with change may need a remedy like arsenicum album, album which is in fact arsenic. Um, so homeopathy, in my book, is an excellent um, therapy, but you have to have a vet who knows um, what he or she is doing and really well versed in it and is not going to be just working on the symptom level but is looking at it from a constitutional point of view. Now let's take a look at the Tellington T-Touch perspective. Again, observation is the basis of T-Touch just as it is of um, zoopharmacognosy and any other therapy that we, we would like to mention. So a full body observation would allow us to determine whether the animal is carrying tension in and in which parts of the body. Um, are there hot spots? Are the muscles tense and tight? Is the skin tight like a drum? Um, and then not only observing the animal in a stationary position or lying down, but asking the animal to move and seeing the animal move may help us see whether it's his posture is balanced and the movement is fluid or is there something going on in the joints or in some part of the body which is interfering with free movement. So any abnormality in any of these areas may be an underlying cause for reactive behavior. Then um, T-touch wraps are an excellent way to help animals relax and remove stress. And any of the configurations will be useful. They don't have to be any, anything fancy. Simple, basic configurations like the half wrap or the quarter wrap. If the issue we've seen is with mobility, then some of the other wraps which influence movement you might want to try, uh, like the candy cane, the one that spirals up the leg, or diagonal wrap if we see that the animal is pacing or something like that. So repeated use of the wraps will help the animal discover a space of calm and tranquility. And once the animal has found that space, then it knows it can get there and it will be easier for it to get in there when challenging situations arise. Now, feeling safe is really important. We've said that. Animals that don't feel safe are likely to be reactive. So dogs that are reacting or operating out of a place of anxiety all need one thing, and that is structure. They need to know what to expect, and they need to know what's going to happen next. Um, so this is very similar to people with not all, but many people with Down syndrome. They need to be warned in advance about what to expect when they're going to do something out of their normal routine. Now, I have a nephew who has Down syndrome, and this has been a very important part of his upbringing. To make him feel secure, explaining to him what was going to happen, who was going to be there, what kind of thing he was going to come across, so that he wouldn't be taken aback when confronted with something new. Um, so this means then, to make them feel safe, that's important for them to have a stable routine, but the routine shouldn't be inflexible because then we, because we want them to learn to push the boundaries a little bit later on. So it's a good thing to talk to them and to tell them what's going to happen, that we're going out, that the dog or the person approaching is not a threat, that it isn't a problem, and although we may think that we, they don't understand our words, they do. And they learn, they have a huge vocabulary, they can have a huge vocabulary, 
and they certainly understand our tone of voice. So that I think is an important thing, giving them a structure which is stable, um, but not inflexible. Then confidence building is the next major thing that we have to address because a self-confident animal is one that's more likely to be mentally balanced and emotionally balanced and therefore less prone to be reactive. So we can contribute to building the animal's self-confidence by using an integrated approach. As we've already seen, essential oils um, to reduce anxiety um, foster um, self-confidence because if the animal is not anxious, then it is less likely to be reactive. Then T-touch bodywork also will help to reduce stress and anxiety by loosening the tension at muscular level. And for that, we can use body wraps, head wraps, and the calming band. We've mentioned the body wraps just a little while ago, but here we've got a picture of a head wrap. Now, this is one of the most common ones and easy and really easy to put on. So basically, the wrap is going around the dog's neck and then crossing over between its ears. And because it's crossing over the midline of the body, then it's involving both hemispheres of the brain. So it's helping to integrate what's going on in that animal. If barking is a major part of the animal's reactive response, then a calming band can be a very useful thing, but it's not only for barking. And this is very simple. You can make it yourself. It's just a piece of black or any color of elastic really. Um, and the width of the elastic will depend on the size of the dog. You sew it into a circle, place it around the animal's neck, then make it into a figure of eight and put it over the, the, the nose. And this helps. We know that the mouth is the gateway to the seat of the emotions, which is the limbic system in the brain. So if we can bring the animal's attention to its mouth, then we can get it to start thinking and bringing down its emotional level. Um, another important thing, very important thing, is the T-Touch Confidence Course. The Confidence Course is also known as the playground of higher learning. So the groundwork is an excellent strategy for building confidence and balance, physical, and if we've got physical balance, we can improve mental and emotional balance as well. So setting up a course, you can incorporate as many elements as you can, like a labyrinth if you've got sticks to make one, um, surfaces of any kind. It can be pieces of carpet, pieces of cardboard, um, pieces of rubber, anything at all which has a different texture. We can have poles, leaves, anything. And even if we are working on a harder surface, even with a piece of chalk, we can draw a labyrinth and use it, use that. We don't have to make a huge investment because we can do all these movements even around the furniture in our own sitting room. Or if we go to a park, we can weave around trees, we can get sticks and ask the dogs to go over them as poles, we can have grass surface, we can have a gravel path, we can have all kinds dirt, anything. So we don't have to make a huge investment to be able to do this. The important thing to remember is that this work should be done slowly and mindfully without forcing the dog. There's no competitive element involved in it. There's no right or wrong. And just what we want to see is what the animal can cope with. Can it go over different surfaces happily? Can it go around weeds? Is its body flexible enough to be able to do that? Can it keep its mind on what we're asking it to do? So the other important thing is options, which we've mentioned a little bit earlier on. Animals that are reactive due to anxiety and fear need to know that they have options. Um, and as we all know from our own experience, if you feel cornered, you are less likely to be calm because you'd be worrying about how you're going to get out of this situation that you find yourself in. So some tools that may be useful in this context are the homing pigeon configuration of using two uh, leads when you're working with the animal. The beeline or the butterfly, the beeline is very simple. Just put a piece of rope through the ring on the back of the harness with one person at either end, 
and walk. And the dog then can choose whether it wants to go to more towards one person or more towards another. So it learns that it can move away if he feels uncomfortable. And if you want to look at these things in more detail, there's the book called Harnessing Your Dog's Potential by Linda Tillington Jones's sister, Robin Hood, and her daughter, Mandy Pretty. So um, that is um, a useful book to have because they go through each exercise um, in detail. Then once we are working to foster self-confidence and balance, we said earlier that dogs that are anxious need to have a stable routine, but not inflexible. And as we foster self-confidence and balance, then we have to begin to think about how we might help the dog gradually relay, raise its threshold so to be able to cope with a wider range of situations without becoming aroused. This is important, but we mustn't push the animal. We must take it at the animal's pace. So there's an excellent T-touch exercise that we can use when reactivity occurs in response to some concrete object in the environment, like, for example, a bicycle, people, other dogs, skateboards, anything like that. And since the most common concern um, that people have generally is dog-to-dog -dog reactivity, I'm going to take that as an example. Now, this um, reactivity exercise um, is, was devised by a T-Touch instructor called Kathy Cascade, who is a specialist in working with reactive dogs. That is what she does. She works with reactive dogs that nobody else would work with. So the first thing to do is to set up a groundwork circuit. And rather than beginning, we are going to work with a dog. And this dog is, is afraid or anxious about other dogs. So we're not going to start off with another real dog. The best thing to do is to start off with a stuffy dog. So we set the dog, the stuffy, up some distance away. And it's important that the, even although it's not a real dog, it shouldn't be facing the, the working dog because stuffed dogs have glass eyes and those eyes can give the impression of staring so we don't want it to be staring at our working dog and so we will allow our working dog to see the stuffy but um, if he begins to stare then we'll gently redirect his gaze and this is important because often people um, think it's best not to let a reactive a dog that reacts to other dogs, not to let him see the other dog. This is actually not a very good idea. So we'll start walking the working dog um, around the outside of the course and then going over poles and through the labyrinth. And it's important to have mindful movement and not aimless wandering. And that's why the having a little course is an important thing because if we don't have something that we can direct our movement towards, then we do tend to wander aimlessly. So what we want to do is keep the dog's mind engaged. And by doing this, we'll see what his distance is, what is his comfortable distance with regard to the stuffy dog. Is it 100 meters? Is it 75 meters, 50, 20, 10, whatever? So we will, once we've discovered that, because we'll see that he begins to react when he comes close to his, what is not comfortable anymore, then we will work within his comfort zone. And then the dog will come to realize that the stuffy does not actually pose a threat. And gradually then the distance can be reduced. The next step is to introduce a real dog. But it's very important that the dog that we introduce here has to be a neutral dog. I was very fortunate when I was doing this work at the beginning to have a, a really neutral dog called Jakey. Jakey just didn't bat an eyelid, so he was absolutely perfect for this kind of work. And we will repeat the same exercises, in, except instead of using a stuffy, we've got a neutral dog. And the neutral dog at the beginning can simply be sitting down or lying down at the feet of his uh, owner. And when the working dog is comfortable with this, the neutral dog can then begin to move and go around the circuit. The dog should not come face to face, of course, and it's better if the neutral dog goes in the lead 
because then the working dog can follow and see at all times what's happening. But the distance will be great enough so as not to initiate arousal in the working dog. For example, if you were going through the labyrinth, then the neutral dog would be exiting the labyrinth at the far end before the working dog enters. And gradually, the distance can be reduced when we see that the working dog feels comfortable with it. And then, um, when we're working, we know that pauses are really important because a pause gives animals the opportunity to process what's going on. So the communication between both handlers must be good so that they will both pause at the same time. And the pauses should be brief, but long enough to give the animal time to process, but not so long that the animals begin to become bored. Because if they begin to get bored, then their minds are no longer engaged. So then after that, you can begin to walk the dogs in parallel, maintaining sufficient distance between them so that they feel comfortable still. In fact, at the beginning, the both handlers may be um, on the inside and the dog on the outside of each handler. Um, and if necessary, um, then you can have a person walking in the middle as a visual barrier. Then you may take one dog to the other side of its handler and then eventually both dogs on the inside of the handlers. Um, but all of this has to be done bearing in mind what the dog can cope with. So when you feel the dog is ready, they can work around the circuit, possibly in opposite directions, so that at certain points they will be coming um, facing each other, but not head on. So if the, if the dogs want to look at each other, you should allow them to do that, but not allow them to stare. So again, if necessary, at first, a person may step between the dogs as a visual barrier. Um, when the working dog learns to be calm and comfortable, then more than one dog may be involved, but always make sure that the dogs that you choose are going to be neutral dogs who are happy to be around other dogs. You don't want to bring in a dog who is himself reactive to help out another reactive dog. And never give in to the temptation to test the waters and bring the dogs face to face. Because with one false move, you may ruin all your good work. So don't be impatient. Make your sessions short and sweet. And each session could be maybe 10 to 15 minutes, not more. And it may take some time to get to where you want to be, but always um, appreciate little steps forward that you do take. If you keep the sessions short and sweet and end on a positive note, then the dog takes away that positive experience and he can learn from a positive experience. And then during the pause between one session and the next, he has time to assimilate what he has learned. And we know that a lot goes on um, when animals are assimilating, even in their sleep. So, another other important point, some golden rules we might say, are to make sure that you're working with a loose lead, that there's no pressure on the dog's neck and hopefully you will be using a harness with two points of contact. Give the dog sufficient space. The bigger the space, the better it is for the dog because he will feel more safe and secure because he knows he has options to move away if he needs to. Your communication with the dog must be clear. Your communication with the dog and with the other handler. And really important, this next point, be aware of your own emotional state. Remain calm and collected. You have to be as neutral as your neutral dog, and no matter how the working dog reacts. So you have to remain calm, cool, calm, and collected at all times. And remember that the lead that you are holding acts like an umbilical cord to the dog. So your emotional, um, emotional states can be transmitted just as surely as, it, as food would be transmitted through the umbilical cord to its fetus. So we've looked now at um, zoopharmacognosy, I've mentioned homeopathy, and we've had a look at T-touch work. But what I don't think is a good idea, and what I would like you not to do, is to just keep all of these things in separate compartments. 
it's always best to integrate all your resources. So when you're doing grind work, you can carry a little cloth with essential oil for the dog that's found calming and chosen. And if you see that the dog has become a little bit stressed or is beginning to become aroused, then you can stop and do some T-touch body work. You can also put on a wrap <clears throat> even before the sessions begin. Or in the middle of the session, you can stop and put on a wrap, which would help the dog relax and focus. And then you can also introduce other things, which some of you may be using anyway, like Bach flower remedies. So some Bach flower remedies, which might be useful under these circumstances. For dogs that lack self-confidence, we have Cerato. For dogs that are overwhelmed by their environment and the burdens that life places upon them, Hornbeam, and this is generally the case for dogs that are reactive. Dogs that are afraid of unknown things, rock rose, for example, and nebulous for fear of physical things like people or other animals or bicycles or whatever. For those people who are living in the north of England, um, there is another whole range of essences called Lakeland essences, which also um, has different options. So for releasing old obstacles, you've got snake's head fritillary, which is a flower, um, giving birth to a new self, which is basically what we would like this animal to do. Um, then there's another one called waterfall, which contains gem essences. And like a waterfall, in a waterfall, the water is flowing freely. And so this helps to soften, relax, and help animals go with the flow. So it's good for releasing stagnant or blocked energy and letting go of habitual emotions or stuck emotions or self-defeating habits and so on. So moving from fear to something more positive, which is what we would like to see in the animals that we will be working with. But while we're doing all this, while we're trying to improve the animal's self-confidence and overcome his fear and helping the animal to cope better, life goes on and if we are talking about dogs, which we are here, then the dog will be walking out in the streets every day. So if you have identified the things on walks that have brought to the action, try to avoid them as far as possible. Find another route, find a different way, cross to the other side of the road or whatever. It will be impossible to avoid things completely, but do your best to reduce the triggers for the reactivity while you're working to improve the animal's self-confidence and reduce its anxiety. Remember to keep a loose lead and remember to keep your head and stay calm no matter what. So when things happen, and they inevitably will, then asking an aroused and frightened dog to sit and sit and stay is normally not the best strategy because a dog that is in a situation that it finds fearful wants to get out of there as soon as possible. So by asking that animal, especially if it's on a lead, to sit and stay may be totally counterproductive. So a better thing to do is to walk, continue, keep it in movement, but don't walk in a straight line. Walk in zigzags, walk in a circle, change direction, all of these things to keep the dog mindful so that it's thinking. It has to think, where are we going now? Am I going to the right? Am I going to the left? Am I going by another side? Am I going back to where I was? So keep the animal thinking. And if you're carrying your Zorfana cloth with an oil on it, as soon as you notice that the dog is beginning to be upset, bring out your cloth and offer it. You can also stop and do some ear work, T-touch ear work or mouth work. And often when the animal begins to be aroused, the tail will go up and remember, that that tail is going up because the brain has sent a message to say there is a stressful situation coming on. The animal responds to that. So if we can stroke the tail down, then we are countermanding that signal and sending a non arousal signal to the brain. So we're actually helping that dog um, not have a reactive response or at least reduce its reactive response. One... Um, exception to this is dogs which have tails that are naturally up and curling like for example Akita's and so on we don't bring their tails down because we have experienced 
that for them it's counterproductive. So, but for most breeds of dogs, the natural position for a relaxed tail is down and wagging gently from side to side. So um, if the animal with a normal tail um, is beginning to be getting, its tail goes up in arousal, stroking it down can help it um, countermand this and return to a thinking position. So we've looked at all these things now. So now we've got the resources, which I've mentioned some of them already. You've got All Wrapped Up, which is again a book written by um, Linda Tellington Jones' sister, Robin Hood, and her daughter Mandy, which is only to do with wraps, all the different wrapping configurations. Then the book I just mentioned, Harnessing Your Dog's Potential, which goes through all the groundwork and various other things. It also looks at harnesses, the pros and cons of the different types of harness. Um, so that's a useful thing. And then um, the T-Touch Groundwork for Reactivity, which was devised by Cathy Cascade, is there are videos on both of these sites. The first one, Friends of the Dog, .co.za, that is the South African Tellington Tea Touch um, site, and they've got a video on there. And the next one, spiritdog.com, is actually Kathy's own website, and her method is called Same Solutions for Dogs. So you might want to have a look at that. And the final link there, Living Magically, is the one for the Lakeland Essences. So I hope you have enjoyed this webinar and I hope you will have found it useful and have something to take away that you can use with your animals when you find yourself in a situation that um, you would like to change something. But just remember, take everything always at the animal speed. Don't push it, don't force it, and keep your head and work at the animal's pace. Thank you. Bye.